Are you curious about slow food and wine? What's really special about the Alto Adige region of Italy? And can you choose wine according to your zodiac sign? Well, that's what we're going to learn tonight on our discussion with these two wonderful guests who I'm going to introduce in a moment. If you're watching this video on the replay, please, in the comments, type the word replay. And if you like, let me know where you're logging in from. Where are you and what's the weather like? Similarly, if you're here with us live, I'd also love to hear from you as well. Um, as we go through this uh, conversation, I want to hear your comments, your questions. I'll be diving into the comments to, to answer them and um, to uh, see what you're thinking. So I'm Natalie McLean, and I offer popular online wine and food pairing courses, and you've just joined one of the most passionate groups of wine lovers on the web who gather weekly to talk to the most interesting people in the world of wine. Now, back to our guests. Gina Birch grew up in Florida. Hello, Gina. Hi. And she, hello. She earned a Bachelor of Arts in Journalism and Public Relations from Troy University in Alabama. Her first job was in radio news, which eventually led her to Fort Myers, where she lives today. And she there she hosted a top-rated morning show for almost 15 years. She also started writing about food and wine and travel and spirits for USA Today the Napa Register, and Fort Myers News Press. We also have with us Julie Glenn, who <laughs> earned her, hello Julie, she earned her master's degree in communication from the Slow Food University of Gastronomic Sciences in Piedmont, Italy, and she's fluent in Italian. She also has an undergraduate degree in mass communications from the University of Missouri. She began her broadcasting career as a reporter, anchor, producer for both CBS and NBC affiliates. And before becoming news director at WGCU, the NPR affiliate for Southwest Florida, Julie was the regular wine columnist for the Naples Daily News. Gina and Julie have been friends for years, and they host the Great Minds podcast, which um, is also broadcasted on NPR. They talk about the people, culture, and history behind wines, as well as travel and food pairings. And they've also interviewed some of the best known people in the wine world. And as they note, I love this, they've only destroyed one soundboard while tasting in the studio. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> and they join me now from Florida. Welcome, Gina and Julie. So glad to have you here with us. Oh, thank you for having us. We've been looking forward to this for a long time. Fantastic. So All excited. Right. Good. All right. So tell us how you met. Um, where were you? Uh, Take it away. Like, how did you two ladies meet? You know, I feel like I've known Julie forever. <laughs> I think I met you at Bistro 41, uh, the former restaurant in Bell Tower in Fort Myers. Because I, I, when I came back from the master's degree in Italy, I thought I'd be a freelance writer, but it was the recession. So no. So I ended up selling wine. So my job as a wine salesperson was to go to restaurant to restaurant to store to store and try to sell my wines. And I was always going to Bistro 41 because it was just a fun place to hang out. And Gina's best friend was managing there, and she was always doing the wine tastings. And when you go there, she was always doing 10,000 things, so you wait for at least an hour. So I would always be sitting there next to Gina, who's also tasting along with her friend, Cindy. So um, I was kind of like, who is this person? And why is she just kind of moving in on the wine tastings? Just trying to get three <laughs> drinks here. But at, at first, I was kind of like, who is this? But then I was starting to get to know her, and I was like, she is genuinely interested and educated and uh actually a super cool person so my initial like trying to squeeze on free tastings <laughs> that went away pretty quick and since then we've become fast friends and she's one of the best people i've met in the last probably 15 years oh well thank you you know julie and i have similar backgrounds we both have a, a passion for wine and our broadcast background as well so you know we were kind of kindred spirits uh, from the beginning yes it sounds like and is that kind of why you think the two of you work so well together, the chemistry, I mean, you obviously share a passion for wine, but are you yin and yang, or is there um, contrasting personalities that somehow fit together in another way? I would say so. I mean, I think I'm more of the, and my friends joke and call me uh, the United Nations, Switzerland, because I always try to be like, oh, though, it's not so bad, or it's it's good, or I try to find some redeeming quality about even the, the worst wine. Uh, Julie will just say, this tastes like butt you know, or something, you know, it's just like, <laughs> there's nothing she'll just say. And, and she, her face, she does, n she does not have a poker face. So you can tell, no. you know, she'll just get all squinched up and like, okay, well, 
So we do have yeah. that. We bring that. That's how we are kind of opposite, and um, and it, but it makes it fun. Absolutely. That's Gina's great. more of the fun, goes out, does all the stuff, and she's that person. I'm the one that's going to bury my nose in a book and figure out the entire history of, <laughs> like, for example, where the heck Zinfandel came from. And I will go on about it for hours and bore everyone. And I can't read a room and know that everybody's like just trying to get drunk, get me to shut up. But yeah, I'm that guy. <laughs> Whereas Gina's more like, chill it out, Julie. <laughs> that sounds like a, a good match. Speaking of pairings. Um... So can you remember the first bottle you two shared together, talked about? Gosh, I don't know. There were so one many. one of our favorites was probably, I think my favorite was the Broman. Whenever Bob Broman would come to town and I'd bring him in there and his wines are just so good. And every once in a while he'd be Bob there. Broman from? Um, he's in Napa. Okay. Uh, Broman Cellars. Um, he's in Napa and he's awesome. He had a huge history of winemaking and then he started his own thing a few years before I started selling wine. So he was one of my first ride widths ever. And he's always consistently been my favorite winemaker as a human being and as good wines. Mm -hmm. And sadly he stopped making Syrah, but he makes mainly just Cab and Sauvignon Blanc. But his Sauvignon Blanc is bomb. Oh, so. wow. And you mentioned ride width, so explain what you mean by that. Well, in the wine industry, one of the things that they do, which is a weird, really strange, steep learning curve, mm -hmm. is you're a sales rep. You go to a hotel, you pick up the wine maker or winery principal. In many cases, sometimes you get a national sales manager too, which is helpful because they help with the selling. They're better at that because that's like what they do. But people like to meet the winemakers and the people who own the wineries. So um, you take them to all your accounts and they have better luck usually selling their wines into the wine list and things like that. So they weirdly have to get into random salespeople's cars and some of the stories I've heard have been hilarious about how gross cars are of salespeople because they like living them, you know? Um, so there's like a, probably a one inch layer of French fries on the bottom because uh, they have no time, you know? But it's, uh, it's an interesting thing, uh, the ride with. And I know you both have ride with stories. So Gina, what, what is your favorite ride with story? You know, I had to, um, I had a little convertible. I mean, like, I had maybe whatever was considered a backseat was really not a backseat. And um, I had to pick up, I was helping a, a friend in the distribution company pick up Nils Vengi. Nils is famous. You know, he was, he's a pioneer in Napa. He was um, the first winemaker to get a hundred points from Parker when he was working at Groth. He now does Saddleback Cellars. He's a big guy and he had a big suitcase. And I'm like, how am I going to get this in my car? So I had to put the top down. I had to like somehow wedge the suitcase in the back because I had no trunk, wedge Nils in. And then we went to the first uh, place where I was taking him and I was helping. I was going to open some of the wine for him and I broke a cork. Oh, no. And I'm like, I cannot break it for the Nils Vengi's corks. And now I'm like, now I'm sweating. Now I'm getting nervous. I'm like, what am I doing? I don't, I don't shouldn't be here. And then, you know, it was just horrible. But he was such a, such a gracious guy and we ended up having a great time together. And, and uh, Julie, you, do you have a particular drive with story? Probably one of the more embarrassing moments of my life. Uh, I had just gotten back from Italy and I had just kind of started. So my mind is all in Italy grapes, Italian winemakers, Italian wine styles, all that stuff. But in Southwest Florida, California is king. So everybody loves everything from Napa. And that's pretty much it. So everybody knows the ins and outs and who's who and all that stuff. So. My ride with that day was with Dr. Ravana, who owns Ravana, obviously. Okay. Um, so he gets in my car and we're driving around and he's kind of talking and trying to engage with me. And I'm just kind of smiling and nodding because I don't really know the California scene at the time. And he said, well, um, my consulting winemaker is Heidi Barrett. And he, I was like, okay. He goes, <laughs> do you know who that is? And I was like, sorry, I don't. <laughs> I think he wanted to pull the door open and tuck and roll and get out of my car. The rest of the day, he barely said anything. To me. Yeah, she's a famous. Yeah, person. she's kind of a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, super big deal. So I, I felt really. And then when I looked her up later and told somebody else in the wine business, that's what I said. They were like, "No wonder he fell asleep later in the car and didn't talk to you." Anymore. But he was very nice. But he was he wasn't like a total jerk about it. But I'm so mortified. How do you not know who Heidi Barrett is? But I'd only worked for a few months in the United States, so I was just kind of out of it. It wasn't my scene at the time, but it became my scene pretty quick. 
Sure. It's more I'm fine. sure you have absorbed lots of tips as you drove along. It almost sounds like you're on a, a book tour, like you're taking this author, mm -hmm. but instead the winemaker, to all of these wine shops instead of bookshops. So I'm sure you, you pick up a lot of tips as you go along. Um, and have you guys ever disagreed over a particular bottle or wine or region? Uh, we, I think we've disagreed over bottles before because we, you know, even though we're a lot alike, we, we still have our own personal preferences and, you know, wine is so subjective. It's like art and, you know, you taste different things on different days. What is it, a root or a fruit or, um, you know, just depending on your, some days, some weeks, all I taste is cherry and everything, you know, it's just, it's just different. Um, but we don't have any major disagreements. I think we both uh, appreciate quality wine, whether it's a grape, we, it's one of our favorites or not. We appreciate a good, well-made wine. Mm -hmm. And what have you come across now? I know, Julie, you're, you're blunt, but how do you handle, or do you even take on air uh, wine that you both really don't like? Like, do you, do you talk about wines you don't like? I probably shouldn't, but sometimes I do. <laughs> I feel just, bad because yeah, I mean, when they're just, and I'll say it's me. I'll always say it's me. I won't say the wine, sub, like, objectively is crap unless it's flawed. But I won't say this is just horrible, the worst thing I've ever, I wouldn't do that. But it's just, this is not working for me right now. That's usually what I'll say. Right. And that means, to me, I'm not recognizing the quality, but I do appreciate the effort. But I just don't think that I would ever buy it just because it doesn't work for my taste. And I think it is, I mean, it may be the best thing in the world for some people. Sure. But it's just not for me. Yeah. Uh, my standard line is, this is unlike anything I've ever tasted. <laughs> <laughs> like, That's on. a good one. It's like what newspaper is. Jill, you also have a story about Pinot Grigio. Uh, Another that. embarrassing one. This is oh, awesome. Perfect. I'm sitting, if you're ever in the, city, the town of Parma, which the school is in Piedmont, but the campus I was on for that first year of communication was near Parma. So I lived in Parma, Italy for a year. And uh, there's a place on the main street, which uh, it's been 15 years, so I forget, but it's called Enoteca Fontana, but it's not right next to a fountain, so it's a little confusing, but they have the <laughs> best wines. I'm sitting there, and I just wanted a still white wine. I just did, I was Proseccoed out, because that is Prosecco country, but I didn't want Prosecco at that moment, so I just wanted a still white. So I sat down, and I was still new to the area, so um, I kind of looked at the thing, and I was like, I'll just take your... Pinot Grigio, and it comes out and it's pink, and I sat there and waited and waited and waited, and I was like, I'm sorry, I ordered Pinot Grigio, what is this? She goes, that's our Pinot Grigio. I was like, really? She brought the bottle and showed it to me, and that's when it occurred to me, it's Grigio because the skins are gray, because it has a little bit of color, and when you do it the way they really do it there, they um, have a little bit of pink to it, so I was like, okay, thank you. <laughs> I felt so dumb, but I learned. Yeah. You learn by embarrassment pretty easily in the wine world, right? Oh, in life. Isn't that how, like, the things we remember most are when we're mortified or, uh, you know, it, th those emotions are, they lock in those memories even more so than sometimes the positive right. ones. But, yeah, you never forget mm -hmm. those things. <laughs> it's a core memory. <laughs> yes. A and Gina, let's, let's make sure we're handing out the embarrassment equally. Do you have an embarrassing wine story? <laughs> Well, I think the Nils Vindy one was what yes. ranks up there for me. Um, yeah, you know, I, there, there are probably more than I can count of, you know, when I was learning, like, like Julie said, um, uh, sometimes I act like I know, you know, walk up and like, well, why are we tasting in this order? And the, and the, I said that in Oregon once and the guy said, because that's how we do it here. And I'm like, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I did pull up on a, on a crush pad once in, in a rental car. It was a small winery, and it was just this big uh, concrete slab. So I just rolled right up, and <laughs> he came out. Oh, my God. He yelled, get off my crush pad. And I looked around, like, this looks like a parking lot to me. I'm sorry. And I backed off. <laughs> they do. And that, of course, is where the trucks come in and dump the grapes. Yeah. Yeah. You might be in the way there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that is great. We didn't hit it off so well, but... <laughs> um, so you both live in the Naples Fort Myers area and of course the the Napa or sorry the Naples Winter Wine Festival is famous. Why is it unlike other wine festivals? What goes on? You know, I think it's it's a combination of things and I don't know how they were able to tap into this, but 
you've got celebrity and star power. You've got people flying in from all over the world. They're paying fifteen thousand dollars to come here. So this is not a you know your weekend regular weekend wine festival. And the lots that they auction off are ridiculous. And they have McLarens that are specially made. You know, cars just just for this. The uh, they have uh, these Magnums and trips around the world with with famous winemakers. And people come here. They have money. They want to spend it. They want to have fun. It's like an exclusive club, and they've raised over two hundred and twenty million dollars. It's one of the highest grossing in the last twenty years. And what's the cause? The children's charities. So they go to a lot of um, you know, hospitals and and education, and they've really done a lot. Naples is one of those communities that where you have the haves and the have-nots. You know, there's a big distinction there, and that's helping to kind of make that a little more even, I guess. It's kind of weird because you have Naples, which is really high end, and then 20 minutes away you have the farm worker village called Immokalee. And it's a great little town, it's a little tight knit town, but there's a lot of need there. Um, so it's Naples Children Education Foundation, NCEF, and they have tons of money there in Immokalee with a lot of programs for after school. There's an entire giant building. It's really fabulous what they've done. And I think I think one of the appeals is that it's very international it's not very like site specific it's not american only it's not washington it's not napa it's naples and everybody in the world comes and i think they kind of i think some of the winemakers and principals like you know how you get to go to a convention you meet other people who do the same stuff it's just kind of fun so i think that they like coming to this to reconnect with people that they know it's kind of like i don't want to say it's a conference but they are socialize and you get to talk to each other and then the people who spend tons of money on the wine get to talk with people they're buying it from so they really like that kind of interaction awesome yeah and, and paying fifteen thousand dollars just to get in the door that then they bid on all of these exclusive lots and things that that is amazing yeah and there's lots of dinners too right at people's homes uh, with wine yeah and man you should see it they have like interior designers come in and completely transform a penthouse penthouse condo and they had one look at like the interior of a giant plane one time, oh my gosh. like with windows and yeah, just for the dinner. It's yeah, it's crazy. Like and then the, they'll yeah, the hosts are like as throwing a wedding. It's like you know they spend that much money on florists and entertainment and designers. Yeah, it's it's insane. Musicians, and then they have chefs come from all over the country and the world who cook in these people's incredible kitchens. Which I don't know if they've ever even cooked in them themselves because the restaurants <laughs> here are always full, but. Um, the, and they have beautiful kitchens, so these chefs come in, they're like, dang. <laughs> but they come in and do um, the cooking for the dinner, and then uh, they have a sommelier assigned to each wine dinner, and then it's paired with a given winemaker. So like Chateau Petrus was here one year, and it was with, um, I think it was, I don't remember, um, but a chef, I think from Chicago, uh -huh. and we could smell it, and I was just like, this is so good. <laughs> but um, it was really that those were great moments. And then, you know, um, the owner of Chateau Petrus is there for dinner, too. And they're sitting there side by side, enjoying the wine with this wonderful chef prepared meal. And they're all top star chefs. Wow. My only question is, do they take volunteer sommeliers to pour wine or, or even just wash glasses? <laughs> yeah, th yeah they do. Interestingly, they do take some volunteers that will help. With pouring wine, especially at the auction, you'll see every wine sales rep lines up to be able to be part of that in this area. It's like a who's who of everybody in the wine industry in Southwest Florida that has been here long enough to get their name in there. And then they'll be pouring wine for people at the auction tables. The wine that is flowing, it's not like, you know, your house wine. It's like they're just pouring bottle after bottle of Chateau Montrachet. I mean, <laughs> champagne. I mean, you're just like, <laughs> it's awesome. Yes. Oh my gosh. And then, so one year you, uh, you both do interviews with the people who come in, um, which is a great opportunity, but you met um, Salvatore Ferragamo. Tell us who he is and what happened. Well, Ferragamo, the house of Ferragamo, I mean, uh, Italian uh, designers, the, the shoes, the uh, apparel is just top notch. It's, it's expensive. It's beautiful. It's elegant. And he also makes wine. They have a, um, I think they have a, a, a like a, I can't say Chateau because it's in Tuscany, but they've got a, a, a place where you could go. They've got, so hospitality is a big deal. And um, yeah, Salvatore came like in. Like an experience. Yes. 
And yeah. um, Julie and I are sitting there, and we're like, oh, Salvatore Ferragamo. And then we start looking at, oh my gosh, what are we? Who do we wear? Look at our shoes. Less for less shoes. <laughs> Stick at our <laughs> shoes. And, the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he comes in looking like he just stepped out of a magazine, just the suit that fits perfect <laughs> and the shoes. And, and he's so and gracious and, and handsome. Yeah. <laughs> And we're like, like we're... <laughs> nice to meet you. Like I had my bubba teeth in, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And how was that he was cool. an interviewee? Yeah. He, he was, was really nice. He was yeah. super cool. Very charming. Very my nice. Favorite, my favorite Italian that was charming was when we talked with Ferrari from uh, Trentino Doc. When we were like, so which came first? The car or the wine? <laughs> he was like the wine because <laughs> cars didn't happen until the early 1900s and we've been around since whenever i'm like okay thank you for straightening that out but he was sweet too huh, i love that trento doc stuff yeah absolutely and you're also drawn julie to the alto adige region why is that what is unique about that particular italian region i just think it's so overlooked and it's so beautiful it's beautiful to visit it's not commercialized one of the things that turns me off and makes me kind of sad in the wine world is the commodities, commodific, treating wine as a commodity. And it feels like I'm an Alto Adige, they don't do that yet. Hopefully they never will. But I really think that white wines from Italy are some of the most overlooked and delicious things in the world, personally, and Alto Adige does an incredible job with them. When I was there at some little tiny hotel that I rolled up to with no plans, I ate at their little rest restaurant and I had a Gewurztraminer that was like life changing. And that grape I had dismissed for so many years, but that Gewurztraminer was it. And now I've tried every Gewurztraminer I can ever since and I'm seeing a little bit of it, but it was like their house wine. It was incredible. Wow. It's so like you're trying to recapture that memory like uh, the, the chef or the critic, the restaurant critic in Ratatouille. Reminded yeah. of uh, his mother's past of. <laughs> is, is that was that the wine that was your aha wine that started it all, or was there a wine before that that really said oh, to you like, oh, I need to know more about wine? Things have changed a lot since the early '90s, but um, <laughs> and that's when I first started learning about wine. And uh, I am not going to be too proud, and I will just admit that my aha wine was Camus Conundrum in 1993 yes. or four. Full Napa wine. Mm -hmm. It was a yeah. big, good red, white wine blend. And back then it was really good and it didn't taste like vanilla syrup. <laughs> now I would not, sorry, I'm gonna be honest. It's, sorry, Camus, love y'all, but no, mm -mm. Right. it's not the same. It's a different wine. Yeah. I don't know if it was global warming or just the decision to have things be exactly the same every single year. So they have, because again, it's more of a commodity, but this is when it was first out there and um, I really liked it back then. And then when my French friend told me this is like a red wine drinker's white, and back then it kind of was, uh -huh. then I was like, okay, I feel a little bit better. And then I started getting into Shiraz because that was the era. And um, you know, when you're coming off of Coke and Diet Coke as a teenager, it kind of makes sense to go with more fruit forward stuff when you're a young 20s person. Sure. So I can kind of see that, Yes, absolutely. but that's what I did. And, and Gina, there's no wine shame here, but what was the wine that sort of was your aha kind of wine? Well, I was a wine snob very on, early on, because I knew which type of white zen I preferred, oh. Behringer or Sutter Home. No, I don't want that. Yes, I want that. No, but um, um, I think the wine that really flipped it for me was um, a Jack London Zinfandel. And this is why it did, because it was the first time I put a lot of effort into cooking a meal to match the wine. And when I made this beef dish and picked this particular wine, I had a little help, you know, choosing which one. It was just like this, you know? And it's like, that's how food and wine are supposed to be. And then I was like, oh, you know, I had that moment where now I want, I'm thinking differently about wine. It's not just a, you know, knock back. And I always knew food went with wine. I mean, I went, as a kid, we'd have a little bit of wine with dinner, but um, this was when I owned it and I really learned it and appreciated it on my own as an adult. Hmm. Wow. And, and uh, 
interesting on food and wine pairings. Have you ever had uh, a really weird or unusual food and wine pairing, Gina? I went to a wine dinner and they had something with grilled pineapple and Pinot Noir. Really? Did and I was like, oh, what? And I thought, okay, I'm going to be open. Maybe this Pinot has some more tropical notes, or maybe it's got a, a, a brulee kind of note that might go with, because, you know, Pinots are all over the board, and um, it didn't work. You know, I understand what they were going for after the chef explained, but it, it just didn't work. I thought, this is just a waste of a course for me, but, oh, that, yeah. That's a crime against Pinot, then. Yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> that's too bad. How about you, Julie? Do you have any memorable food and wine pairings or, and or any weird ones that you've this was, this is a memorable one, and Gina was there. Remember when we went to that champagne of course dinner with Brian oh, Mullen made all the food? Oh, at yeah. At that wine shop that closed? That was like, I did not expect champagne to go with, what was it, like five or seven courses? Hmm. Of course, Brian's a really good chef here locally, and he um, has a catering thing, and he is just phenomenal. But you give him a challenge. We're going to have seven courses with all champagne and different champagnes, like different vintage, rosé, all different things. And uh, it was just mind-blowing. I fully did not expect it to be that good, and it was incredible. Every single dish went perfectly with every one of the different champagnes. I don't remember what champagne it was, though. Was it Bollinger? I, gosh, I can't remember. But, you know, some of them are so yeasty and big. You need a, 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 a substantial food to eat with it. You just can't sip it you know you need some to really enjoy it i think well you can if you really challenge yourself yeah i know you can don't give me I, that you can't just sip it i know you <laughs> I, I would not kick any champagne out of bed i would cuddle it all night long <laughs> that's great but that is a good point to make julie like we we don't think of we often don't think of champagne or any other sparkling wine as anything but the beginning of the meal or for a toast or whatever but mm -hmm. it can, it's one of the most food friendly wines on the planet between the natural city and that swarm of bubbles did, was the chef able to pair it with like a meaty dish as well? Uh, he did. I remember there was like a kind of a short rib type thing, mm -hmm. but done on the light side without like tomato or anything like that. So it was fantastic, but it was very rich. It was like on a truffle cream kind of a situation. Mm -hmm. So that acidity just cut right through. But another great champagne pairing is uh, potato chips or fried chicken. Oh yeah. Love it. Love that. Totally. The shabby chic. Getting a little yeah. lowbrow there, but it's good. <laughs> yeah. I always say it's like rhinestones on jeans. You know, you can dress it up or down and yeah. <laughs> be a night just with the, the wine itself. Oh, that's fantastic. So I mentioned, Julie, that you uh, went to Slow Food University in Italy. What, what was that like? What did you do as part of the studies there? Uh, and why did you d decide to go there in the first place? I, got a th I was a member of Slow Food for years because I've always liked that idea of, yeah, there's fast food, but let's not forget where it all originates and why we eat what we eat what we eat and all that stuff i always thought that was really interesting because of my rabbit hole nature of having to find everything out but uh i always was a member of slow food and then i got a thing in the mail and i was really getting tired of tv news because it's a drag after a while and uh it was a thing saying we're starting this communication program it's a one-year master's program go ahead and apply. I'm like, yeah, I'll apply. If they accept me, I'll go ahead and go. It's a sign because <laughs> I believe in signs all the time. So I'm kind of like, well, it's a sign. If, if they want me, then they clearly it's something I need to do. And they were only accepting 23 students from all around the world. And we ended up with 23 students from 11 different countries and uh, they accepted me. So I was like, well, I have to make this happen. So I packed up one giant suitcase, like a big gross American and moved over there for a year with my dog in a backpack. <laughs> I was so embarrassed because I was like, because there's no Americans with Disabilities Act over in Europe. So you're changing trains and you're like, Ugh, all the way down the stairs, man, it was a workout. But I finally got there. Uh, yeah, it was it was a challenge. But the year was incredible. Once I finally found an apartment, speaking no Italian at all when I got there. I had taken three years of French, which was useless and is now completely gone. Because the Italian crowd, uh, there's a finite amount of space in the brain, I think, for languages for me. So the French is gone, but the Italian's there. So, but it wasn't when I got there. But uh, the courses were all taught in English, which was great. We had to study five main things, which is pasta, wine, cheese, cured meats, and olive oil. Those were our five main things. That sounds main. like hell. Yeah, all the homework. <laughs> oh, 
Yeah. It was terrible. I don't know how I lived through it. But then uh, we had what they call stage, which is where you go to different places. So we went to Campania, Tuscany, uh, many different regions uh, throughout Italy. And then we had to go to um, Burgundy, France, where I ate more escargot in a week than I think anybody ever has because I love that. And then uh, we had to also go to Spain, we went to Barcelona, and we went to um, Germany. I love how she um, says, we had to go. We had to go. <laughs> well, it was funny because the Germans in the class were mad we had to go to Germany. They were like, we don't have any good food. Let's go somewhere else. <laughs> but it actually, it turned out it was really good. It was super informative. I learned a ton. There's nothing like being there to learn things. And that's what Gina is so good about getting to do because she travels so much. So, so much. I'm gonna ask her about that in a minute. But you met your husband there. How did that? Was he a student, Julie? No, oh. no. So where did you pick him up? <laughs> at a restaurant. So I'm sitting there at a restaurant eating potato-filled raviolis, which sounds redundant, but it was the lightest, fluffy potato. It like mashed, kind of like it was so good inside of a ravioli. And I'm in Parma, which is ravioli land, and it's in a truffle cream sauce. So I'm sitting here cutting it with my butter knife, trying to make it last. Well, he thinks I'm eating steak. So he, re he leans over. I, I saw him when he walked in the door. He walked in the door of the restaurant and I was like, oh, there's trouble. <laughs> and I was right. Was I not, Gina? Yes. Trouble or am I? <laughs> so he uh, comes in, sits like a table away, and he says, to piace carne, which so means, do you like meat? Okay. Yeah, he's speaking Italian. I don't speak Italian. I've got a little dictionary. And he's like, do you like meat? That was his line. Okay. At least he didn't say sausage. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> the piaggio carne. I'm like, I'm not eating meat. What are you talking about? I'm having a ravioli that's filled with potatoes. And I'm with a vegetarian. <laughs> I was with a couple other girls from class. But, um, yeah, it was uh, quite the come on. But anyway, the next night I met him in the piazza at 8 o'clock because he sent me a text what? saying, I will see you in the piazza at 8. That was it. <laughs> I'm looking it up in my dictionary and I asked the other people in the class that spoke Italian. I was like, what does this mean? They're like, it says, see you in Piazza Garibaldi at eight. I was like, okay, I guess I'm going to go there. And of course I showed up in like Eskimo boots cause it's cold. And in Italy, you don't do that. They're walking around in stilettos on cobblestone streets with ice and snow. And I'm wearing these Ugg boots, jeans and a giant fat coat. Not the Italian style at all. And he's like in this beautiful trench coat, nice shoes. Yes. He goes, you look like an Eskimo. He's like, yeah. It's cold. What are you talking about? <laughs> wow, and it still worked yeah. out. You know, do you like me? Do I see you in the piazza? You look like an Eskimo. That doesn't sound like the unfolding of a love story. <laughs> no. no. It's it worked out. Yeah. All right. It's been 13 years that we've been married now, so... And I don't think anybody saw that coming. No. Anybody who knew no, us. No. I don't think anybody saw it working out, but it's worked out great. That is great. Awesome. And uh, Gina, now you do travel a lot for what you do, especially um, your column for USA Today, the 10 Best column. Tell us about that. Well, uh, so 10 Best is a division of USA Today that's travel related. And so I am the local editor for Fort Myers. So I will write. 10 best Italian restaurants, 10 best wine bars, 10 best things to do with your kids. So it covers a, a large spectrum. But also, um, when I travel, I put ten, like went to Portugal, 10 reasons why everyone's flocking to Portugal. Um, I just Tell went- Tell us about those. I, I'd love uh, to hear about Portugal. Well, so we that, Portugal? yeah, so this was pre-pandemic and some of the reasons were uh, it's affordable, uh, the hospitality, the food is amazing. Uh, the wine is spectacular, the scenery, um, and, and they, they have, I think, more UNESCO World Heritage Sites than any other country or, or per capita or something. I might have that statistic wrong, but, but I mean, they've got just such a diverse uh, culture and climate and uh, miles and miles of coastline and uh, the inland area where uh, the Alentejo, where some of the wines are, it's just phenomenal. I think a lot of them are underrated, like Julie was saying, the Alto Adige, it's, uh, I think the same with a lot of the Portuguese wines, and, and I just I just love that whole area. It was wonderful. And did you get into Oporto, the the town where they all the the barrels are aging and it's oh yeah, like alcohol 
heaven all the time. <laughs> it was crazy. You know, we went in some of those caves and they were like some ports there that were over a hundred years old. They had cobwebs on them. And um, it was just a really interesting uh, place to discover. And then recently you were in Dubai. Went to Dubai for the World Expo. And um, it was supposed to have been last year, but we all know what happened last year, right? Nobody went anywhere last year. And everything in Dubai is over the top to begin with. And this expo was, it's like a thousand acres. There are almost 200 pavilions. And this is the first time every country had their own pavilion. Um, I've never been to a World Fair or World Expo before, so I didn't know what to expect. But this was just, just mind-blowing, really. And to discover a lot of these different countries and uh, most of the pavilions had some kind of food and wine, which was really fascinating for me to try all these different cuisines. I just wanted to eat. It's like Epcot on steroids. You know, I just wanted yeah, to eat my way. Say, around. All the pavilions, you know, all the countries. Right. Probably a little bit more authentic than Disney. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> much more, much more. Yes. <laughs> and it wasn't just food and wine, you know, they had innovations and, um, technology and it was in there were so many more things to the expo than just food and wine so and does Dubai have a wine culture or is wine illegal there I, I get that mixed well up. yeah we'll see fun. wine you know, you know Dubai's Muslim so you're not supposed to drink and okay. but in the hotels and in restaurants and most of the restaurants are in hotels that's how they get away with it, um, that you are able to have alcohol. And I mean, I had some, some of the best craft cocktails I've had in Dubai and I've had wine was from all over the world. I did not find out how they import it, if it's like a three tier system or if it's government controlled or if they let, you know, the companies that are not, that are American or, you know, foreign companies bring it in. I'm not sure how that works, but in every restaurant, there was a, a decent wine list, so. I didn't have any trouble having wine with my food. <laughs> That's great. And it's a city sort of in the middle of the desert, isn't it? I, I, I think, was Sex in the City, the movie filmed there? Or something? Yeah. So yeah. Sex in the City was in Abu Dhabi, which is neighboring wow. Dubai. And they're a little more conservative there. So we did go there and I had to, you know, cover a little, be more conservative about shoulders and knees and those kinds of things. Um, but yeah, it is in the desert. It's the uh, Arabian Sea or the Arabian Gulf, which on the other side, people call it the Persian Gulf, but it's the same body of water. So they really have to fly everything in. So it's really expensive. Um, but I'm telling you, it is just like no place I've ever been. And if you ever have a chance to go to Dubai, it's um, the architecture is insane and the technology and, and, and yeah, they do have fashion. Not everyone's all covered up. It's just a really intriguing place to visit. And, and Julie, your love is in Italy, but is there any other memorable wine region that comes to mind that you've visited? Sorry, <clears throat> taking a minute. I'm trying to think. Yeah, no, no worries. I really found Spain to be interesting okay. down around Barcelona. Uh -huh. We went to, I still don't know how to pronounce it, but I've been there. It's Frigine, you know, the cava producer there? Yes. That was wild. Talk about a commodity. We went on a tram through their cellars, which is like a two mile ride. And all the walls are covered in bottles. They're all just sitting there. Um, and you can see every once in a while, one of them is blown up because of the secondary fermentation blows the bottom of the bottle out. So I kind of let those went off when we were driving by. Speaking of bubbly, Lambrusco, you had a story about Lambrusco or discovering it. Yeah, well, you know, I had kind of dismissed it for so long. And then you go live in the land where they make it. And in Parma, it makes sense because it really goes, I mean, Parma, obviously, prosciutto di Parma, the Parmigiano Reggiano, all the different like high salt, fatty things that they have, that they make there that are the best in the world. Why would you not have a sparkling dry red wine to go with it? I mean, they have the Prosecco for the whites, but then... I kind of had always dismissed it, and then I got a bottle of Lambrusco there, and it was a dry Lambrusco. They're not sweet over there, although that's all I'd ever had here in the United States was always sweet Lambrusco, which is gross. I'll just say it. It's gross. It's not good. Right. Not suggested. Would not recommend. But over there, I got a bottle of Lambrusco. Of course, it was cheap, you know, and I had a glass. I'm by myself, me and my dog. He's not partaking, and... Um, so I had a glass and I was like, this is so great. I love it, but I'm done. How do I preserve this? So I called a friend from my class. I was like, what do I do to preserve a bottle of Lambrusco? This cork is not going back in, you know, little mushroom corks. Mm -hmm. And he goes, just throw it away. 
was so cute. Just put it in your fridge, cook with it later, or throw it away. That's it. And does it taste pretty grapey, pretty sort of purpley, blueberry-ish? Not like, you know, like, remember the sparkling Shiraz that happened for a while from, it's not as big as that at all. It's much more lean, uh, not very fruit forward, um, and definitely not sweet, but it's very refreshing. It's perfect with, um, when you have like fatty prosciutto or things like that. So I thought it was really good. It's just almost impossible to find here because there's no market for it. Right, right, yeah. It's treated still as a novelty always a trend piece saying Limbrusco it's coming back I don't know if it ever was <laughs> yeah. here but anyway Gina you uh you were at Shadow Montalena in uh, Napa and what did you see or do there you know I, that's one of my favorite aesthetic looking um chateaus I mean it's so beautiful the grounds the uh, gardens and the history there of that wine. And um, I have a friend who used to be in the hospitality industry here in Southwest Florida, George Blankensee, and he had moved out to um, Chateau Montalena to work. And there were several of us, I joined some people from the hospitality industry and we went just messing around, drinking around Napa, you know, and trying and calling on all of our friends for, for special tours and tastings. And he took us around um, into the cellar and we went and he said, I'm going to show you something. And we all got really excited. And he pulled out a bottle of 1973 Chardonnay. It was a Magnum, you know, from the Judgment in Paris. This is the, the wine that put California on the map. And it was like, he brought it out and we were all like putting our hands on it. Like it was the baby Jesus. Oh, oh let me feel the, feel it. And then he would let us hold it. Like, like, like the baby Jesus, you know, and I'm just, I'm like, somebody needs to get this away from me. I know I'm going to drop it. And it's going to be like, oh, it's going to be one of those moments where you broke the last bottle of this famous wine. And so. As you said, and for those who may not know, the, the 1976 Judgment of Paris, uh, organized by Steven Spurrier, wine critic. Uh, recently passed away, rest in peace, but mm -hmm. over in Paris, pitted California and French wines in a blind tasting using French critics to judge who was the best. And that was one of them that triumphed from California. The other was Stag's Leap, I think, in the red category. Right. Okay. Yeah, okay, cool. So you're holding this bottle. Was was it the last one? Or <laughs> I guess there wouldn't be very many left. If Probably not. It sounds better for me to say it was the last yes, one, yes, you know, because it's more dramatic, but I'm I sure... I'm sure they have a lot stashed here and there in their museum or something too. I guess they were. So on the anniversary of that, so a few years ago, Naples Winter Wine Festival, one of the things that they had added were these luncheons prior to the festival itself. And they had the primary people from the Judgment of Paris, Stephen Spurrier and um, I can't remember everybody's name, but they were there. And we all tasted through the Chateau Montalena Chardonnays from 73 on through up to now, not every single one of them, but like every few years. And we looked at the difference in the color of the wine and how it, it was just, that was a really cool experience mm -hmm. that, it's one of the add-ons to the uh, Winter Wine Festival thing that they've started. Cause people want it to last forever when they get here. <laughs> but that was a cool one. That was awesome. And was the 73 still holding together or had it kind it was of- still, It was still standing up. Oh. It was still standing up. Some of the ones in the middle, like in the 80s, were just not doing so great, like one or two. One might have been flawed in a certain way, but we weren't sure. I mean, I'm not going to say I know more than them, but um, it seemed like it was, there was something wrong with it. But um, the rest of them were all great. And the color, the color difference was just really cool to see, yeah. like side by side. I love those comparative tastings. I mean, mm -hmm. it's only side by side. People think you have some magical ability sometimes as a wine taster. It's, you only, it, those differences only jump out at you when you've got uh, side by side comparison. It makes it a lot of them, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gina, you are also in Lemieux or the, and touring the St. Hilaire Abbey where Dom Perignon spent some time before going up to Champagne. So what was that like? Yeah, you know, it was really interesting because um, it was my first time to that region uh, of France and um, and learning about Lemieux and, um, you know, the, the sparkling wines that they make there and how they make it and the specific grapes. And uh, we went to this abbey and I thought we were going to be tasting wine in the abbey. Well, no, it's an abbey. They're not serving wine. So I was a little bit disappointed. But we went into one of the caves and it was dark and it was like a little bit wet and um 
in our the guy who was telling us about the story of Dom Perignon, he goes, he spent time here, and he said he was a naughty monk. He was a oh, naughty really? monk. I'm like, oh, he was a naughty monk. Hmm. Is that why he? I don't know. He wouldn't tell us. I couldn't find out. Um, Is there a nunnery close by? Just yeah, right. That, that, yeah. See, I should I should have asked Julie so she could dig into that for me a little more. But then you know we know the story. Dom went up to Champagne, and the climate was different, and um, he was trying to they say replicate what he had tasted in Lemieux, and and that's how Champagne was you know come about. That's one story. Um, right. But we were there, and we were like. T- pet- petting the walls and I'm like oh, you know like oh this is where it all happened and should there's stuff coming there's water coming should we like taste it what if it's really champagne you know, we just or, or uh, sparkling wine the walls it are sweating just, champagne. it was just yeah right <laughs> it was fun we were just you know having one of those moments where you touch a part of history and you're there and yeah. not many people get to do that it was really exciting for me as a, as a sparkling wine and champagne lover yeah that that is part of the magic of travel and just of drinking wine to imagine mm-hmm. how many I, I, I always think of Maya in the movie Sideways, how many hands have touched that wine and, you know, the lo- some, of, some of them are dead now. And yeah. Things that have changed the, the history that those grapes, vines, wine has seen. But, uh, yeah, that's definitely mm-hmm. part of the magic of it. Um, all right. So let's get to the Zodiac. I don't want to miss that. Um, Julie, this is your specialty, but I know you both talk about this on the Great Minds podcast. Um, mm-hmm. So, Julie, t- tell me, what drew you to astrology, I guess? Um, how did this all start? I just always liked astrology because I've always liked that I'm a Leo. So I've always been, like, into that. And I just always kind of feel like different signs have certain personality traits. And I feel like grapes kind of have certain personality traits, traits too. And just like people, their personalities can be changed or diverted or solidified or made more negative or more positive based on the surroundings, their individual terroir as a human. And I think grapes are kind of the same way. They, but they have a basic like internal structure that can then be changed by how it's grown, what its conditions are and how it's vinified. So I've always kind of liked these little like core bone marrow correlations between a grape and a personality type in the zodiac. And I've just always found it fun and challenging to kind of pair them as far as how they behave and like what their personalities are. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to like the grape that kind of correlates with your own personality or with your own sign. For example, I don't like my grape, but it just works for the sign because of what it is. So, I mean, I don't dislike the grape. I mean, I'll drink it, but it's not my favorite for sure. But it's funny because my husband is an Aquarius. And I am a Leo. So Leo is very much like Cab, not because of the whole king of the jungle, but and because it's like the king grape, but because both Leos and Cabs do better when with others. As a Leo, I like to have my people around me. I don't like being on my own. I like feedback. I like to get people's take on things. I'm just, I function better, and most Leos do, with their crew, with their squad, their people. And I think Cab, while it can do well on its own, at 100% cab, it can be okay, but it's almost always better with a little bit of somebody else in there, a little bit of Merlot, a little bit of Cab Franc, a little bit of something to soften it up, a little Syrah, love Syrah with some cab, but I just feel like as a grape, that's kind of how it behaves. I mean, it thinks it's all things to all people at 100%. It's like, I rock. And Leo's have a huge ego, like me. Like, I think I can do anything in the world. I mean, I do. I'll be honest, I, I, I'm learning more and more about my ego. But then my husband, is an Aquarius and Gene is an Aquarius too. And they are the impatient ones. They are the first out of the gate. And when it comes to the circle of the Zodiac, so they are Gamay, which is our wonderful Beaujolais grape. And I, that is my favorite go-to. If I'm going to go get a bottle of wine at a store, I'm going to the Beaujolais section and I'm getting a crew Beaujolais. And, and I love them because they're flighty. They're um, dreamers, they dream big, and they're, they really get you out of your headspace. So um, Gina and my other great friend, Michelle, and my husband, I seem to surround myself by either Aquarians or Libras. So it's kind of unusual. Interesting. But that's, that's who that is. Yeah, aren't you a Libra, Natalie? Yeah. I am a Libra. 
journey for us. So I want to know, um, I actually want to know my entire destiny, but for tonight, <laughs> what should I be drinking? <laughs> well, I paired Libra with Pinot Noir because Pinot yes. Noir is beautiful. It's beautiful, delicate, and delicious. And Libras can be a little delicate. They have to be balanced. And if they're not balanced, if they're out of balance, then they're... Whacked. Just... It's not good. <laughs> Yeah, there are some Libras that I totally love, and then some Libras I just go to the other side of the street to get away from. Same with Pinot Noir. Sometimes there are Pinot Noirs, and I'm just like, oh, God, no. But then there are some Pinot Noirs, but they, Libras like pretty things. They like sparkly things. They like things to be shiny and beautiful and just. Yeah, I love the bling. Um, but they are just that way, and Pinot Noir kind of is that way. It doesn't, it's, not, it's kind of particular. They like things to be the way they want them. And they want things to be balanced, and they have to be balanced. When they're out of balance, it's just no bueno. I love this. And it's also like a floral. It can be a floral, effusive, beautiful, perfumey wine when the grape is made into the wine. But as a grape, if you just have straight Pinot Noir grape juice, it's still really pretty and floral. And it's very sweet, of course, because none of the sugar has been turned to alcohol yet. But um, it's, it's delicious. I love this. It, it, it... Honestly, the way you've described Leo, Aquarius, and Libra, it makes sense. It doesn't feel just like a shtick or something. It actually really makes a lot of sense. And and just, you, you folks don't know this, but anyone who um, listens to uh, my lives on Facebook or this podcast going back, Pinot is my go-to. That's mm -hmm. all I drink is Pinot Noir. So it was the wine in my stars. It was my destiny. <laughs> <laughs> so I marinated on this for a lot of years. I really did. And I just... <laughs> It's taken me a long time to just drill down into, I mean, obvious is Capricorn is totally Nebbiolo. Like, so obviously. Like Capricorns, because Capricorns don't change. They are who they are. They are traditional. They are hard workers. They cannot be deviated from whatever. And Nebbiolo is never going to be deviated. You try and it's going to be a mess. Remember when they tried to overwater it to up, up production back in the day? It was disgusting. You can't do that. <laughs> The Capricorns are the same way. You can't devi you can't dilute them. They're very linear and headstrong. They are determined human beings. Wow. Does anyone does any sign get white Zinfandel or anything? <laughs> well, Sagittarius is Zinfandel because Sagittarius is like the partier. And sometimes Zinfandel goes through its like disco phase, like leisure suit, and that was the white Zin period for Zinfandel. So yeah. It's just fun. I just love doing it. That is great. I love that. Um, and any other uh, predictions or signs or anything to keep in mind as a Libra? Should I decant? No, I guess I don't have to decant Pinot. You know, I know that. But uh, any other wine tips for, for uh, Libra or any other uh, signs? Well, I, did, I started doing the white grapes, which is much harder because, as you know, white can be very different from producer to producer to place to place. But my favoriteest of the whites has been assigning Acertico to cancer. Because ah, okay. if you think about a cancer, they're very, and I understand cancer because I'm on the cusp, so they're super emotional. They are very guarded. And, they, um, and if you think about Acertico, they're, they're homebodies too. They don't really like to travel a lot for the most part. Some do. But um, cancers kind of like their little space. And Acertico likes its space. You don't see it growing anywhere but Santorini. And the way that they grow it there is with the little nest where they take the vine into like a little protective nest and the grapes are growing on the inside to protect it from the uh, wind and stuff. You know, that's how cancers are. They have that little shell up there always protecting themselves. And that's kind of my favorite as far as like, but there, it can be a very intense and acidic wine and it's, but it's balanced and it's fantastic. And cancers at their best are just intense, wonderful human beings that are just so good. Then conversely, on the red side, cancer is a Syrah because it's also like a little velvety blanket sometimes. They're the caring people that take care of you and love you. And they're the people you run to when you really need somebody. So just like Syrah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, Gina, you were talking, uh, back to NPR. So I can imagine you two, you were friends, you want to do something together, you both had broadcast history, so I guess it just made sense to do a podcast, um, but you, you've got this NPR extension, which is great for the podcast. 
Uh, but tell me about Dave Powell, the interview <laughs> with Dave Powell, and why you were reluctant to actually air it on NPR. Well, you know, Dave Powell is made history in Barroso as uh, with Torbrick. I mean, he's he did just a just a pioneering winemaker and does some amazing things. He left there and he formed Powell and Son with his son. And uh, I think he may have been here for the Naples Winter Wine Festival. And Julie and I went to a, a wine shop and met him, tasted through his, I mean, his just this beautiful Grenache and Syrahs and um, uh, all kinds of great wines that he has. And uh, we were interviewing they're not him. not cheap either. No, they're not. I mean, they're, they're, they're pricey. It was a $200 Grenache. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Sit there on a shelf, you're walking by. But yeah. it was good and it was worth it. So Sorry. he starts talking and he's got a really thick Aussie accent. I'm not even going to try to um, do it. And as we're talking, he's getting animated and he's talking about the story. And then he just stops dropping the F-bomb, F and this and this F and that and F and good. And then he's got this thick accent and we're just following him. And we, So it was hard to understand, but we could understand the F-bombs. And we got back to the studio. And we're like, what are we going to do with this? You know, we had just started our podcast, like, is this okay for NPR? Well, it's a podcast, so it's not really in those parameters. He had such, such a thick accent, and we just kept trying to imitate him and trying to and listen and understand, and it was just so, we just had so much fun with it, and I think we ended up airing part of it and just left it and said, we're not going to beep anything, we're just going to just see 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 where the cards lie or fall, you know, after this one. It, sure. it was fun. <laughs> Did anyone pick up on it, or was his accent just so... Nobody, seemed, nobody said anything. And, and I, it almost just sounded like it was natural, like it should be. He should be saying that, you know? And so maybe it was just people just, I didn't get any feedback. So we just, we just. Okay. I didn't either. He was miking wine from gripes. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and from effing gripes. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Oh, colorful people you guys have met. It just sounds amazing. So, um, Julie, on, on your podcast, you've also shared openly about having cancer, and I'm very sorry to hear that. How, how has that affected the way you taste wine or what you drink? Um, I'm very curious. I, I've actually you know, read about how depression, because I've suffered from depression, can take your smell away, and that terrifies me. And of course, during COVID, people have lost their sense of smell, but how, yeah. how, have you, how has cancer affected your taste or smell of wine? Smell has always been on. I've always had a really sensitive nose. And uh, I mean, I can smell a corked wine from across the room oh, full of wine. Yes. Like I'm just very overly sensitive yeah. this way. Yes. But the problem has been the chemo didn't really do anything. So they took me off of it, but they put me on an immunotherapy drug called Avastin, which makes it hard. It's impossible for your body to grow new blood vessels. But that has impacted my tongue, which I always had a geographic tongue to begin with, which looks like what it sounds like, geographic. And with, think about a topographical map. It just get, when it gets inflamed whenever I eat fruit that has been ripened off the plant. There's some kind of a fermentation that happens when the sugar ripens in a, plant, a fruit that's not on the plant. And like particularly with pineapples, the acidity that's created, I think it's a malic acid of some sort, but it really fires it up. So that treatment just kind of made that a little bit worse like i'm much more sensitive that way but my taste went for a while it's getting back to normal it's steady now but it went towards where all i could taste was acid remember gina mm -hmm. i mean yeah. all i could taste was the acidity and the alcohol so that lambrusco stuff suddenly tasted pretty good <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was nice yeah, and sweet and fruity <laughs> <laughs> no but it uh it was an interesting journey and it was frustrating, but also because it's brain cancer, I really didn't want headaches. So it was okay because I didn't really want to drink a lot of wine sure. um, at all. But my go-to when I come home after a busy day and I'm stressed is the Dolan Vermouth Blanc from France, which is just a white vermouth, but not super dry. It's the kind of in-between one, in-between the red and the that with a, on ice with a squeeze of orange is perfection to me. Oh, I love it. Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds but yeah, so as far as wine, I've gone more towards whites as a result of all the, te the taste situation. But I also live in Florida and I was kind of heading that direction anyway because it's 5,000 degrees here every single day. 
and having an Amarone here is like, that although that is my boyfriend, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dal Forno um, Amarone. Every time I see it at a tasting, I'm like, that's my boyfriend right there. <laughs> <laughs> that one I will choke down in the middle of the summer. Yeah. Um, no, she, no, she but, will yeah, push I, people out of her way to go ta at a tasting to get to that. I've seen it. I've been, I've been pushed. Yeah, she's like, she's seen it. Lasers in on that and just goes for it. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. I like that with certain Pinots. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite Pinot? My Do you favorite, have faith? Oh, usually, you know, I'm pretty promiscuous. <laughs> so <laughs> I always say the one somebody else bought. Yeah. Me, but, um, I'm loving right now La Crema from Russian River. Mm. So some of the La Cremas, as long as they're from cool climates, I think most of them are. But this Russian River one, it's, of course, more expensive than the others because I'm just destined to like expensive wines. But um, I've been loving that. And then we make a lot of great um, Pinots here in Niagara and BC. So Blue, Hill, or sorry, Blue Mountain in BC. Here in Niagara, there's the, the Clos Jordan. Um, maybe some, some that you haven't heard of, but they're they're fabulous. I love, I do love Pinots that are sort of nervy, edgy, kind of like people on, on the, the edge of a nervous mm -hmm. breakdown. Like you just don't know, is this gonna stay together in the glass? Um, <laughs> but I find that quivering sort of intensity very attractive in, in, in the wine and the people. Hmm. So, yeah. So. That is very Libra of you. Yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> the yes, same thing. Yeah, it's balancing, <laughs> teetering. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just teetering on the balance. Hey, um, Gina, do you remember the name of the... We did interview a Canadian winemaker. Oh, yeah, from Okinawan. Okinawa, um, gosh, what oh, was yes. it? Okan uh, sorry. The o now I've got Okanagan. Okanagan. Okanagan, yes. Yes. Oh, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Wine, oh, my gosh. We had some of the... So good. Oh, the, the Rieslings it? and the Gewurztraminers from there were just... Uh, some of the sorry, best I've had. Did you say it was? Do you remember the winery sorry? name? Uh, do you remember the winery name? I can look I'm it John, up real quick. Yeah, look it up. I'm Did John. Did you say John? Um, what was his last name? What was it? Was it? Uh, Hang on. Painted Rock. No. 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 John Skinner. No. 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 Somebody else. P -R -A -P -E. That's okay. She's she's checking. <laughs> <laughs> she is intense, isn't she? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. She's got to know the details. Sorry. <laughs> that's great. No, that's fine. Martin's Lane. Oh, okay. Martin's Lane. Yeah. Winery. Okanagan Valley, and yeah. it, yeah. he was awesome. It was uh, Shane Munn. Shane Munn is the guy, and he was really a great interview, mm -hmm. and the wines were incredible. But on the subject of Pinot Noir, sorry to drag us backwards, but I wanted to suggest, I don't know if you've had a chance to try this one yet, but at Naples Wine Wine Festival, Gina, you'll remember we went through the tasting room, and we got to try uh, Carlo Mondavi's Rain Pinot Noir R A E N. Oh, so we're from the coast, Sonoma. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Yeah. Totally recommend. Okay, I'm going to find how to get that wine. <laughs> yeah, it's a good one. Yes. Yeah, it's quite good. All right, thank you for that. All right, let's go into the rapid fire. Oh today. boy. <laughs> I just want to stay till late tonight. <laughs> no, I guess we better get moving, huh? No, it's okay. This has been fabulous. So, I need to switch from coffee to wine at some point. Yes, I know. I've got this mug, but you don't know what's in it. Well, mine um, either. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, do you remember a favorite childhood food that you would now take and pair with wine? Oh, pizza all day long. I mean, oh, okay. that never goes out. You know, I, I, I wouldn't have, I, I think you're thinking like peanut butter banana sandwich or bologna and, and <laughs> chips or something. You know, I'm sure I would pair champagne or sparkling wine with all of it. You know, anything okay. that's salty and fatty or has a little bit of, of, of fruit too, it's just, I think champagne's universal. It just goes with everything, you know? It is. A it blanc is. de blanc or a brut. Yep, that'll work. Julie, do you have a favorite childhood food that you would pair with wine? I was a weird kid, so my favorite thing in all of my childhood was escargot. There was a place in Kansas City called Stevenson's Apple Orchard, and every special occasion, that's where we went for dinner because I wanted to have escargot wow. every time. Wow. And I'd steal everybody else's. Of course, I mean, otherwise, I'd done little dubbies and Diet Coke like everybody else did in the 80s. But <laughs> special occasion, little dubbies, those little snack cakes. Oh, okay. Kind of like Jill Lewis. Kind of like Hostess, but cheaper. So what would you pair with that? Or Maybe is, 
Maybe a Zen with the Swiss Miss? Yeah. Yeah. That's true. With the, uh, I don't know. Yeah, probably definitely a Zen with the peanut butter things, yeah. the little wafer mm -hmm. things. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Diet Coke is probably better. Sorry. <laughs> what are your favorite wine books? Do you have a wine book that you love? I think Julie's got one there. I have one too. Excellent. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, Karen McNeil. Is it? Is that Karen? No, this is Jancis Robinson. Oh, Jancis Robinson. I was thinking the colors are the same. This is, this is the Jancis new Robinson. one. Oh, the Oxford and here's, Canyon to Wine. Yeah. yeah. And then here <laughs> is the old one, okay. which like decorated by my daughter. Ah, there you and go. has been taped back together because I broke the spine. It's well loved. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, well, that's. That's one of my favorite, but I knew she was going to pull that one out. So I can't, I had to do something different. It's like my Bible. Yeah. And one of mine that I love right now, or that I loved is this. Oh, from, Trim. Yeah. Wine, Moon and Stars, the uh, South, or Southern French winemaker. Yes. Makes so many good wines. So is that a memoir? It is a bit, you know, the beginning, it goes into a lot of his um, history with rugby and a lot of the teams and people, which, uh, you know, I just kind of went, yeah, I got to go past that. But when you get into his grape, the story of how he got into grape uh, winemaking and um, and his philosophy of taking care of the earth and, and, and really is like a little bit of a hippie vibe, you know, the sun and the moon and the stars and, and his passion for the food and the wine. I mean, I just, when I was reading some of it, I'm like, oh, I'm feeling that same thing. And I, I just it was kind of moving. It was, a, it was a, it had just some passion to, to it more than just about his rugby career and, and him, but it was, you know, just about a little bit of a love story of wine as well and, and agriculture and, and everything that goes into making a bottle. So I, I enjoyed reading that one. He sounds like he's now I see why you love him so much. It's not just because he's cute. Oh, he is very dashing. handsome. He is very handsome. You've met him so many times. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're BFFs have ever, now. <laughs> have you interviewed him on Grapevines? We have not, but I've interviewed him a couple That's of weird. times. But we, yeah, we should probably try to work that out. I know he would do it. He's making some new orange wines now and... Um, he's doing some different things, you know, he's always doing something different. So Fantastic. that's, yeah. To seek him out too. He sounds really, I've met him once, but, uh, yeah, that, yeah, he has those other angles to his life, the, the rugby and the mm -hmm. other things going on. Um, and do you have a favorite wine gadget, either of you? Particular gadget you like? Well, you know, I love the Corvin. Oh, yes. It just, wine. yeah, and it helps, like, if I'm trying to figure out, sometimes if I'm tasting wine for a story and I don't really want to open the bottle, I want to save it, I'll just get out a little bit and swirl it so I can actually do some tasting notes. And so that helps me professionally. But this is a new little thing I got. It's, you know, the champagne topper. And you see on there, it's breathless. I love these guys. Now, I never have enough champagne left. But if you wanted to move it or just keep the bubbles in, keep it fresh while you're drinking it, um, Breathless is um, a sparkling wine out of Sonoma, and it's uh, formed by three sisters who made this uh, in, a, in honor of their mother for all the moments that she left them breathless growing up. And her, the mother died of some, some um, lung disease that really does take your breath away. It leaves you breathless. So they have all these, these great touching stories about the love of sisters and family and mom and, and, and just living life, you know, making every breath count. And I just, I love that. And I, and I love the, the stopper that it's gold. And so that's my new favorite gadget. I love those stoppers too. They, they are very practical for champagne because of course you're not going to get that mushroom cork back in the bottle. Right. Nowhere near it. And I don't think the spoon works like putting a spoon in bubbly. <laughs> no. I'm not sure what the science is there, but those stoppers, those specialized Champagne stoppers are really great. Right. Yeah. Julie, do you have any favorite wine gadgets? No, just the way of corkscrew. Yeah, yeah. When somebody gives me those classic. wing corkscrews, I'm just like, stop it. Yeah, I don't like those either. They're hard. I'm not a gadget person really so much. Right. Yeah. No. So I know that I know they have those aeration things that people did where you put it through the thing and I just hate that sound. It just turns off the whole thing for me. Mm. But <laughs> so gadgets you don't one thing like that I was one thing that I was introduced to, Gina and I did a whole tasting thing with Riedel with their wine glasses that are very um, grape specific. Yes. And I really never thought it could be possible that it would be that much of a difference from glass to glass. Right. And he had us put the same wine in four different glasses and it tasted like four different wines. 
So that was really cool. So glassware is the gadget that I could get into. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree with you. I would say. A great one. Well, this has been amazing. So um, is there anything we haven't covered that you'd like to mention? Maybe what you're having for dinner tonight or your plans? You know, I would like to tell people to get in there. If they've got wines that are in the bottom of their closet or under their bed or things that they've been saving, get in there and open those. Because yeah. I have had things in the back of my wine cellar, cellar, I call it a cellar, but it's just a big fridge. I just like to be bougie and say I've got a wine cellar in the house. Um, that it's, they're tucked <laughs> back in there. <laughs> and I forget about them. And um, I've got a 97 Badia Colta Bono that I was on a Zoom call with the winemaker. And he's like, yeah, you need to open that. You know, 97 was a great year, but it's not, you know, we're look at what year we're in now. So you need to get that baby and open it. So it's those things that... You save for a special occasion. Every day is a special occasion. Open the wine and enjoy it and have some friends over and, and don't let it sit until it gets vinegar and you've got to dump it because that is heartbreaking when you have to do that. That's true. Great advice. Any parting words of wisdom, Julie? Try everything. <laughs> All, right. All I would say is just try every darn thing and yes. get into the Italian whites because they are so good. Mm. Plus that Pinot you mentioned. So I have my shopping list or my hunting <laughs> list after we're done here. Um, where can folks reach you online? Well, you uh, can go greatminds.org. To... Right. Mm -hmm. We're also, we have a Facebook and an Instagram called just regular Grape Minds. And uh, it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And we each have our own, Gina Birch and Julie Glenn, we each have our own Instagram pages as, as well. Thank you, Gina, Julie, this has been such a great conversation. I loved it. I can't wait till we can do this in person someday. Yes. For a glass. Will three. you come on our you show with us? The Naples. Yes, of course. You should okay. come to the Naples Winter Wine Festival for sure. I'd love to. It's a beautiful part of the world. And what, what time of year approximately does it? January. January. Good time to go. Good time for yeah. you to get away and come to Florida. Yes. It's beautiful here then. Yeah, Absolutely. it is. Yes. Perfect. Thank so you excited. Thank so much uh, for this. I really, really appreciate it. All right. So bye for now and uh, to be continued. Cheers. Thanks for having me. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>